you know, this is the NeoBooks call for Tuesday, November 26th, 2024. And Klaus is back too. Good. Um, I'm my my instinct asks me to ask Jose for a temperature reading or a landscape read or whatever it might be of the various things that we've been kind of working toward here, which include uh, your R protocols project uh, and neobooksy kind of stuff. But I'm just wondering what your sense of of our location and direction is. And you don't need to have like, there's no right answers. I'm just curious <clears throat> where you see us right now. Um, well, before that, I don't know if Stacy told you the news. I didn't have Which news? news? Um, Stuart passed away this weekend. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, I had Stuart Levine. Mm -hmm. Um, hold on one second. Um, Um, Jose, thank you. Uh, we had no idea. Yeah, and I know that, he, yeah. and I know that he'd been having a very hard time recently with several hospital visits and all that. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, Kim, Kim saw it on Facebook from his, uh, like oh. wife, girlfriend, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. and, uh, and Pat gave me a call. So I'm oh. trying to call as many of, of us as, uh, as we can. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. So that's a bit of not a surprise, but a bit of a shock at the same time. Um so you can expect it so yeah. soon. Yeah. 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 Why don't we um why don't we just have a moment of silence for Stuart and appreciate just remember his being here with us and um thank you for that, Jose. So I'll I'll bring us back out of silence. Um, April is kind of the reason I knew Stuart at all, and she's here with me. And come on, she's not made up or anything like that. But <laughs> you know, straighten out her hair. We we keep that. thinking that she is made up. You make her yeah, up, yeah. but That's so, yeah. no, she's totally an invention in my head. <laughs> it's, it's actually like a Fight Club. There actually is no other personality at all. It's just in my head there. But April's the reason I ever met Stuart, and he made his way into our conversations. And yeah, she's sad like us. Yeah. Um, Kim Wright. I don't know what April, if you know Kim Wright. Kim Wright? You know Kim Wright? No. Kim Wright learned from um, Stuart about collaborative agreements mm -hmm. and turned them into um, conscious contracts. And conscious contracts was a huge influence on our thinking about uh, protocols. Wow. So it's a small world. There's all these different loops and connections. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, nothing emerges from nowhere. Yeah. yeah. It all comes from some of us. Yeah. And Stuart was the, the binding agent in a lot of these things. Yeah. We share God, I think we're Baird Cole. Yeah. So April and he are both Baird Kohler uh, authors. So right. that, that's that's how they had and originally met. He was an early mentor. Like he jumped right in to welcome me and help me. He was uh, he was president of the authors community, right? The co the authors cooperative, yeah. yeah. And I 
when my when they got my book, um, he just jumped right in with a warm welcome and mentoring and just just a lovely human. And um, the whole community, the Barrett Kohler community, is a very special group of of authors and and humans. It's nice to see all yeah. of you. Yeah, yeah, hearts. Mm -hmm. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, I lost you. Hey, I, I, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I was just clicking my little earbuds back in. So there was a moment where it lost me. Um, what time is it where you are, Jerry? It is nine in the morning in Melbourne, uh, Australia. Oh, so, right. I forgot that you were out there. And remember that we moved the call to this time to make room for Jax, who is out here in Australia, who I won't, uh -huh. get, to see, I won't uh -huh. get to see her on this trip. Um, she's moving, moving flats to get closer to her program, the program she's starting at ANU. Um, but I will get to see Wendy. So that's nice. very cool. Who gets to see whether April's a real person or not, whether that was just an avatar popping in behind Jerry's head. <laughs> I, you know, these days with deepfix could have been, I don't know. Could have been, <laughs> been anything. No, I believe she's real. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Stacy, anything on your heart? I mean, I'm, I'm feeling the Stuart news also. I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah. I can't. Okay. Thank you. I'm just I, feeling. When you get a chance, because I did try to look, maybe we could pull up some of his poems. That sounds great. Um, I've got, I've got I've, several of them. I sort of copy pasted in when he read them in our calls. So I, I figured I, that would be nice. I can find those. Yeah, and I, I do want to say one thing because he was on a couple of calls recently and I, I don't know if, if Jose felt this also, but the last few times he really did feel, he really did feel at peace. Like I had definitely noticed a switch, you know, because we would have smaller calls on Friday. And I mean, he was getting positive results and he was still optimistic, but something switched in him where, I mean, he was so grateful for everything he had, but there was something in him that, at least for me, it felt like if I go now, it will be okay. Like, I don't know. He just felt really at peace. Not that he wanted to go. He just felt at peace. Uh -huh. Yeah, I felt that. I agree with that. There we go. I just found uh, the collection of poems that I have of his that I've added to my brain. I just put that link in the chat. Thank you. Um, Jose, if you want to do yeah. an overview. Yeah, if you don't mind, I would like to do that. Um, I thought that. Thank you. And maybe start with what I've been feeling all day since Kim's call, um, which is that we really need to do this work. It's We've built on so much from so many people. Hmm. Sorry. I've been feeling like we need to get more serious about this stuff. And uh, days like today are kind of like, there's reasons for us to do this. Yeah. Um, so in answer to your question, um, prior to the news of Stuart, 
I was already planning on coming here and saying that, <laughs> um, that we've been talking a lot and, and we keep running around in circles. Um, I'd really like for us to start putting together some actions and planning and executing and working uh, to actually do this in a very broad collaborative way. Um, this weekend I worked on the Serving Life booklet and I'd like to seriously look at publishing that in um, as a neo book, not as a neo book, that's a book that we call a neo book, but a neo book that is really something more than that. And I honestly, as much as in my heart, there's lots of things that I could define as parts of the neo book. I don't know what that really looks like, but but I think we need to 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 do that um, and and possibly republish in this new format the, the work that um, Klaus has done. And I'd love to do uh, Stuart's book in that way as well. Um, um, sorry. So just, I, I could go on for a while, but I think I think we've got to get serious if we're going to do this. And if honestly, if we don't get serious, I don't want to be doing this um, because I, I I think we've got very critical things to do. These things aren't just nice to haves. We need this to take things to a new level. These are fundamental pieces of the future of humanity. They're not just nice things to have. And if we're gonna do this, we've gotta do this soon. And we've gotta do this in a big system, not just um, a nice little toy to, to be playing with. Stop there. Um Thanks, Jose. I'll come back to you also because the reason I asked you to paint a landscape of what our multi-projects multi look like is to get a roadmap for what getting the work done looks like. Because from the landscape and from the map, I think we can come back to, well, okay, that implies this and this and this and this happening. And then we can start to kind of map around them and, and think about who, who collaborates with whom to do some piece of it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Mark Antoine, your hand was up earlier. Uh, did you want to go first? I'm. Uh, when you said we need to make this happen, uh, I was thinking more of the protocol work than the neo books angle. But uh, it's all tied, right? But you may know I'm in a, a startup uh, incubator right now, and they're asking me, "What are you? What's your audience? And what are you building exactly? What problem are you solving?" And I keep wanting to solve all the problems, and I decide I had to decide on the first brick. And so the first brick I, I am going to work on technically, which I think is relevant to what you're doing, especially with the protocols, is uh, using a, a kind of schema workbench. And the idea is building good schemas is hard. Uh, and we want the schemas to be abstraction of a type of story or a type of case. And so the workbench would say, here's a story. I think it fits in this schema. Please fit it in the schema for me, which is something an LLM can do e easily. And how much is left out by the schema? So that you can iterate on the schema structure to say, what am I missing from my stories with this schema? And eventually, uh, maybe even have the LM provide schema improvements, but I don't think that's important. What's important is knowing when the schema is not enough, being able to name that and say, okay, here is where I need to grow my schema collection. And maybe finding, of course, finding good schemas for a given story. 
if you have a schema collection. Now, I think that's relevant to the protocol thing, the way I see it. Uh, I don't know if you see it the way I do, but uh, that's something I intend to focus on soon-ish. And that is an object on the map. And we need to figure out how it ties in and like where it relates, but absolutely one of the projects on the map. So thanks, Mark and Tom. Oh, cost, please. Yeah, along the same lines here, when you say this, I would love to see us put some more meat on what is this. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Steve in the social systems, uh, the change management system. Um, and and the the over the, the process structure uh, that you find in CRU, which I think is just amazing, having you know, spent most of my life in in managing projects, um, we 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 have an an agreement on on what what CRU calls presencing, meaning we all understand you know the mess we're in the the. Uh, uh, big issues that need to be solved, and and there's a common understanding of root causes and all of that. So out of that, you come into a process that's called crystallizing. And crystallizing is a process of determining where you want to be, I mean, or where you approximately want to be, right? So what is, uh, what is an outcome that would... Um, that that would meet uh, our our dreams and ideals and 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 um, and uh, uh, bring bring you know, a better world into being. Now, to get from crystallization to this outcome, that's a, a process called prototyping. And in the project world, we would we would call this a design uh, design build. That means you 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 have an you have a structure that's maybe fifty percent of what you know you need to have in place, but then as you move forward, more and more light comes into more and more transparency comes into uh, 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 the understanding of what needs to be done, you know, to get from the point of where you are at to the implementation to the realization. Right. So I'm also working on a startup right now with a, with a group of people. And, and we're going through the same process. And, and that process helps to, to, to stay on path. Right? To, because I, mean, I, I constantly have someone on the team wanting to do this. You know? and, and I'm going, OK, so, so where, where is the, the end station of that you want to just do? So you bring them, call them back in on the path. Right, the pilgrim's path, so to speak. You know, you want to stay on path, um, and so for that, you really want to start out by defining what is this. You know, what do you see on uh, what this is? So, would it make sense, Klaus, for us to apply theory U to the map or of the, the complex of projects that we're talking about? Is that what you're suggesting? Oh, should we, it, should we no, devote a caller? Should we devote a call or two to doing that? And yeah, I know the I mean, process itself is probably longer than a couple calls. Oh, oh totally. But but I mean, you you love protocols, right? Yeah. Think of theory U as a protocol. Um, you know, you you. Uh, I mean, you, it guides you through um, stages, and in each stage, uh, you need to complete certain steps before you move into the next phase. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so that creates a design discipline and a project discipline you know, that helps you get bring the keep the team united for once. That's really an important part, right? Because the vision unites us. And, and and then so any idea or any proposal that that doesn't lead to this vision because it's you know adding something or or changing something that the team hasn't agreed to that's a distraction. So so it gives it you know it creates a pathway towards the desired outcome. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Rick, nice to see you. Um, you missed the news at the top of the call um, that Stuart Levine has passed away. 
Yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. Um, he was having more and more sort of medical incidents and things like that. And uh, apparently on, on Facebook, <clears throat> um, it was posted. So, mm -hmm. um, oh, and we are now sort of talking about uh, the broader, the complex of projects that we represent here and how they intersect mm -hmm. uh, from Marc Antoine's uh, <laughs> work on schemas to Jose's work on protocols to Neo books broadly or narrowly defined. And Klaus was saying, hey, an interesting approach here might be to apply theory U to figuring our, you know, our path forward through this. And that, that sounds uh, quite appealing. Maybe uh, if there were only some kind of artificial intelligence who could help set us up for that. Um, that, would be really, that would be really cool. So, uh, so Klaus, I don't know if you want to ask, you know, uh, work with work with your AI coach to set up a, a couple queries to say, how would how would this group go through it in a in a relatively economic way, meaning I don't think we want to take five calls to do it, <clears throat> but if we could take one or two calls to do it, that would be great. Um, I'm... But tell me, tell me what is this? Because I would need to understand what this is to ask the question to the AI. Yeah, yeah. And I think that our looking for what is the map of these projects is uh, one way of describing the this is like, you know, uh, that that then pulls apart into some uh, sub goals. So um, we'll, we'll come back to it. Go ahead, Jose. As I've said before, I, I think, and now I'm, I'm, as of late, I'm becoming more clear on, on what I think uh, Marc Antoine's work is in, and looking at what he's been doing. And I think we're all working on the same thing uh, at a fundamental level. I think it takes slightly different curves as to what it, what it becomes meaning it could be utilized to be different um, objects of interaction in society, but that fundamentally those objects at a, at a data level, at a manipulation level, they're open source pieces of information that we want to curate independently and openly, and that they're not curated as posts in, uh, in social media, they're not curated as uh, wiki articles, but as something new, something different. And that those new objects then can sort of take on their different lives, if you will, depending on the context. That fundamentally, a protocol, I think, is not any different than a, um, or sorry, a step in a protocol is no different than one of your nuggets. And well, I think I think we had said on an earlier call that protocols and steps in protocols and each of the elements are effectively special purpose nuggets that they're that they're nuggets that have a particular frame to them and fit inside of a particular context for a particular set of uses which are then themselves reusable in other fresh contexts I would agree with that I think there's some nuance in in what what comes first yep because I think the fact that it's a nugget, uh, from a uh, from a neo book perspective, versus a a chunk of information, a, a, a primitive um, that then becomes a nugget, and then or can then become a, a protocol step, or can become a, a bit of knowledge to be tested and validated and played with and verified and so on and so forth. I think all of those things are possible. What the primitive is, I think, is a question that we have to to really think through, and and once we talk about that primitive, that that primitive then should have the ability to be any of the things we've just described. Um, I think that question is is one that uh, would be good for us to understand. This is just one slide of a presentation I gave Saturday 
at the mm -hmm. future of text. Uh, and that's that's why I couldn't meet you, Rick. As apologies, still, and, and explaining, I'm explaining this notion of nested frames as a unit of knowledge, and how nested frames should be connected to text, but they can also be interpreted as structure. So it's this is just illustration, but that's the whole question: What are the primitives? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. I've, I've, you've heard me say that before, and I don't want to hijack uh, with this, but. <laughs> yeah, and we're, I think we've given ourselves enough time yeah. through osmosis to, to sense into where we're all coming from. And yeah. I think that, uh, you know, Rick's focus on learning and an adaptive learning and Klaus's focus on, on being able to produce practical content in a, in a, in a fast way that isn't bogged down by the ultra analytical knowledge structures and so on and so forth. But, uh, but then has that to support moving forward and building from it, we need to do all of the things that we're we represent here. Yes, and and I don't think there's anything here that that shouldn't be represented in what we're trying to do. Correct. My my, you know, concern is that it is a complex thing to do, to both offer the ability of creating a neo book from an author's perspective with tools that provide for that neo book to truly be a neo book which and, still which still to this moment means different things to each of us in the room but that's cool because we'll work our way through what that what that is and how it works i i don't think it necessarily means different things this is what i've come to i think it means the same thing from different perspectives okay in other words i think the perspectives we have all need to be there yeah it's yeah. just that we're only focused on the one perspective ourselves and, or yeah. or some perspectives ourselves mm -hmm. and i think it's the bringing together of all of these pieces to a holistic view of it that is that makes for what it needs to be it isn't that it's your vision and, and not someone else's or someone else's way of doing it and not somebody else's. I think it's all of that together. And the, the difficulty is making it all true. Right. And that, that's kind of where I was going to head, which is philosophically, the conversation is easier than technically, I think, in the sense of we need to somehow find a way to make these things work together, um, perhaps through protocols, perhaps through, you know, metadata, perhaps through other kinds of things. Um, but we're philosophically, we're, we're, we're very aligned. We've been talking about this for a while. It's great. And I would argue that technically, I think there's ways to start this that aren't as rigorous as they should be, but that allow us to, to practice some of this stuff and and I think to err on the side of producing and then slowly building up the stuff that makes it as onerous and as rich and as powerful as it needs to be. I think if we get caught up in the in building the the technical framework to its maximum potential, we lose the power of bringing about what we need to bring about. Hmm. I, I'm, I agree. Uh, and I also think that the experiment we did with the, the how page and the our protocol that you and I created, Jose, is a very nice starting point. I just, I kind of need to write that up and post it because the how page exists. I just haven't mentioned it any place in the world and it needs to look a little bit better than it looks right now. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to boost that up on, on my queue could, of things to we, write about. We should, uh, we should work on that a little bit more together. Um, uh, Cool. And after class, I want to come to Mark Antoine and find out why he's mixed on the on the how protocol page. But uh, first class. Yeah. Can you can you describe your target audience? I mean, who for our protocols or for which? I mean, for this, right? 
Oh, for the this, what this is. Yeah. So, so, so who, who are we talking with and to? Uh, it's a very fair question. And I, I think that each of us with the different pieces has been thinking about our own audience or client. And I mean client here, not in the paying client sense, but in uh, when I when I was le learning under Russ Acuff way back when, one of the first questions he would always ask is, who is the client of the system? <clears throat> and he, he, he just meant, who does the system actually operate for? Who is the, uh, you know, uh, th there was no implication of what is the business model for the system. It was always, you know, who is the actual client? And I think each of us has thought that through to some extent, but we haven't all integrated that with one another. And then there's also, I think there's several layers of clients. One of them is functionally, if this thing, if this thing works and works together and works wonderfully, there's kind of operational clients who are people who would appreciate what we've done and what it means for whatever sectors we want to influence. But then as each of us uses this thing uh, in, for example, uh, the food system, then there's another set of clients who are the uh, people who we're trying to connect, touch, involve in conversation, think with, sense make with, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that, those are the actual, if you want to call them end user clients or something like that, those are the people I think in the end we want to have uh, involved here. Um, and here's Dave. Hey, Dave, uh, good to see you. Uh, you missed at the top of this call that uh, Stuart Levine has passed away. Um, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. He had multiple melanoma and had been very sick and had a couple of uh, sort of emergency room incidents. And the last time he reported in here on a call, um, so he, he has passed. Um, mm -hmm. And we are talking now kind of big picture about the, the agglomeration of projects we have here. Um, you may, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, once I post this call online, you may want to scrub through some of the earlier conversations because I think that you're also bringing some overlap with other projects that might be on our map uh, that would be really interesting to learn about. And, and I think we're, we're, we have a combination of things on the table from, hey, what does the landscape look like of our various projects and how they interact? Um, how do those decompose into uh, steel threads or simple slices of functionality we can take through the things we want to do rather than trying to think of a grand architecture and solve the big puzzle? Why don't we take, you know, bite-sized pieces out of this? It's, you know, how do you eat an elephant a bite at a time? Uh, and then Klaus had mentioned also possibly using Theory U as a construct for us finding our way towards some insights and some practical um, applications of what to do to get to get there. So that's sort of a summary of a piece of our conversation here. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Mark and Tom. Yeah, the, the, there's certainly uh, great work to be done saying, you know, these are the pieces we're bringing. This, this is the functionality we're expecting. These are the use cases we want to solve. It's all relevant and absolutely worth doing together, I think, being a bit systematic about this. Uh, but when you said, who's, who is this for? Who's the client? Who's the target? Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot from my, again, kind of start the piece standpoint. Uh, for a long time, I've been resisting this because on the one hand, uh, I was saying the client is everybody because, and then, and then I realized, no, what I was saying wrong was that the client could be anybody because everybody needs collective intelligence, but the real client is really everybody in the sense it's the collective as an entity. <laughs> That's the real client. However, all that said, right now I'm thinking about who can I sell this to? And I've, one of my difficulties with selling a collective intelligence piece is that if you're selling it to an organization, the person who takes a decision of buying the system doesn't want the system because they're the ones with power and they don't want to relinquish the power to the collective. And so I realize a good entry point is actually audits. Uh, in the, in the I, I quoted my pitch, and I, I really put the emphasis on audits. People take decisions. Decisions are multifactorial and complex. And 
they don't always, they're not able to take into account all the reasons they take a decision and then they come to an audit and why didn't you take this into account? If we get them to have a good tool to take into account here are all the factors I considered and this is how I considered it and everybody could add to that so we know it's more comprehensive, then they could show that to an auditor and say, this is what I took into account. And people who are forced to give account, whether to a board of director, to investors, anything, uh, will have an incentive to use a more multifactorial uh, thinking tool. And, and I think there's a, there's a in there. I don't think it's the ultimate client, but it's the, 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 the buyer, <laughs> the decider, <laughs> the decider and how to get in there. So this is where I'm at on these, this topic of the client. Uh, Rick, Over. Yeah, it's a bit late. I just want to say I just came back from a research uh, conference uh, in primary care. It was an internet, predominantly Canadians and uh, U.S., but there were, it was an international group of people. And uh, it was uh, it, it was just an amazing environment to be with very um, stimulating people, different ideas. I mean, I'm just overflowing from, from it. I'm still processing and making sense of it. But I want to dovetail on something that Jose was talking about, and that is the issue of producing. And we've done a little bit here, but I, I, I would uh, I would like to propose that rather than talking about it, that we actually share some of the things we are actually producing and and having that using this as a sounding board to see, you know, where our our um, overlap is. And Jose, you're quite correct. I mean, I, I'm interested in how can you create complex adaptive learning systems um, and uh, based upon transform transformational and transformative learning. Um, so, um, and that calls for revolution and how you go about doing this. And the most important thing is how do you build community about how to rather than what to, which is very different. Uh, it has why as well, but it's more about co-creation and um, collaboration and, and, and having a sort of decentralized system of self-organizing, uh, self-governing, uh, learning communities and how to design things in such a way that it can have almost an autonomous life that people can come to resources and and uh, go through experiences and then replicate those experiences. So uh, at some point I'd be having just been overstimulated, I'm still processing and coming, bring things together uh, uh, and uh, I can share something at some point. Um, about how to to work towards developing complex adaptive learning systems. Cool. Uh, shall we zoom out a little bit and talk about the broader landscape again to to paint it some? Or does anybody have a mental image of what that could be like? I mean, I'm um, I'm interested in us sort of just throwing things onto what I'm calling a landscape, because I, I see these different projects as being kind of more related in, in different geographies in yeah. some sense. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, of course, I'm, I mean, I'm so specialized in the food food and agriculture world, right? But um, I mean, I've been systematically um, uh, putting, pinging out um, uh, differentiated messages that came, that all come down to the same topic, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to, to really make an impact uh, on climate change and on environmental uh, health, restoration and so on, you need to focus on the soil. Now, that sounds real easy. It took me you know, years to, to come to an understanding of that. Um, but the, 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 microbiome, the microbial life inside the soil determines the soil's capacity to hold water, to influence the hydrologic cycle. Uh, it relates directly to the nutrient content of food that is reflected in the, bio, in the, in the uh, gut microbiome of milk, considering the food that you eat. So, so, there, there is, so, so we were starting to, to um, customize messages to one audience talking about the chemicals in your food you know that 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 transpire into your body 
There is, there, there is glyphosate in the breast milk of American mothers. 80% of the po population have glyphosate in their urine samples. Here's what glyphosate all does, right? They are not so Shimon, for example, his first 1000 days of life of a child points out the nutrient deficiency of foods because our nut the nutrient content is so depleted from 40, 50 years of industrial agriculture that children, even during, even as a fetus during gestation, don't get the nutrient content they need to build their brains. And so Shimon is convinced now that 80% of neurological problems with children are caused by a nutrient deficient diet, right? So farmers are being told and landowners are being told, you're losing the value of your land uh, by depleting its, uh, its microbial content, its biomass and its carbon. So, so the same core, right, soil, um, is being communicated to a host of different groups in different ways that is relevant to their context. Yeah. So when I'm asking what is your target audience, you may have groups, you know, the, the, you, you may have five different groups of target audiences segmented into you know, groups, and each of them needs that same message packaged differently to come to the same route that you're trying to get to. I will add two thoughts to what you just said, Klaus. The first is, hey, RFK Jr. seems to be in charge of health and systems like that. Totally. And, and that opens a, a, a series of cans of worms, some of which are really useful given what you just said, <clears throat> which means there's going to be a need for some different conversations about what causes what, what's happening where, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that, that's like the, the obvious layer um, that I wanted to bring in. But then there's there's like a meta layer on that, which is how these conversations happen is going to be crucial to their success or failure. And typically, there's going to be threads everywhere on socials, on whatever, on whatever, and there's going to be thread wars and people angry and disagreements and flame wars and who knows what. And it mostly degenerates into um, things we we just want to forget about and that don't make any progress. So I think at the meta level, it's interesting here to say, how do we do this better in some credible way that influences the policy processes that are underway without directly aiming at them? Just trying to do the conversation right, ignoring the political... I'm not saying we should all jump up and try to get jobs in the administration or influence them directly. I'm saying if we think about this right and do this right, we have an opportunity to be a credible, credible conversation in that mix. And if that mix starts thinking differently about how policies get made, that's really interesting. And that's I think that's some of the work that Jose is pointing to at the top of the call when he says, we need to do this work because it's really important. Over to you, Jose. I was going a, a little bit different direction uh, from yourself and Klaus. Um, direction meaning that it's it's not divergent. It's just a little bit deeper into um, what I, I think uh, we would agree with. But but here's my thinking on this. We've lost sight of the fact that information is something that human beings get from other human beings for the most part, either directly or indirectly. None of us have information that innately is ours. It's always passed along. And that reality somehow gets lost when we get into our society and all of a sudden we have all these brilliant people who came up with all these beautiful things and they they wrote the right book and they have the right answers and all of this other stuff. And somehow, for me, a picture of humanity, a picture of life that speaks to the fact that we all own information collectively and that it, it is our collective job to make that information as correct, as accurate as possible. And so if we can do this 
as a collective effort rather than a individualistic effort. Yes, by giving people credit where credit is due for connecting the dots that they connected, for aggregating the information that they aggregated, by bringing together whatever it is that they did. We need that. But ultimately, not to state that that any of this stuff is divorced from the collective effort that we do. So building systems that bring collective effort to bear and do so, as Klaus mentioned, in, in ways that are used in unique examples, that the food people are thinking in a different way and the health people are thinking in a different way and the farming people are thinking in a different way and the, the process, food processing folks are thinking in a different way, but they're all thinking about the same things because the same things are flowing through all of aspects of their of their work and of their lives. And we split it up, we fragment it, and we give thought to those people in that column. And we say, well, if you're dealing with food, it has nothing to do with soil. If you're dealing with you know all of this kind of stuff, that's what we do. I think we do that in education by fragmenting education into all these pieces. We do that in, in our industries by fragmenting our industries into all these pieces. And what I think that information could do is actually play a, a huge role in unifying much of what we're talking about and bringing to bear the, the understanding that we are talking about hypotheses of what the world really is like and that it is our job to keep making those hypotheses better and that we can only do that collectively, and that when we do this collectively, that we can find, to uh, Rick's point, better how-tos, better understandings of what's there, and that, that we don't own this proprietarily, but collectively. And that it's not my words in my book, and you can't take my words in my book because it's mine, or you can't take my way of doing something because it's my IP, but that we collectively work together to move things forward in a way that's beneficial to all of us. That to me is the big picture. And if if we're anywhere near that being the right picture or close picture, then to me, we work from there down to, well, how do we fulfill something like that from a, uh, you know, the smallest part that we can look at and, and work from there? What's, what are the primitives? Well, uh, um, <clears throat> thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Jose. Um, okay, two separate things and to add on what's been said and what you said, Jerry, I just, I don't want us to forget because I think you're absolutely right about how important the conversation is. And I just want to say something going back to Stuart. So I loved Stuart. I cried a lot of the morning over Stuart. I only know Stuart from online in different calls. These calls have become like a ritual. Ritual is important to community. These are our rituals, and I don't want us to lose sight of how important they are. I also want to say that Stuart and I, we grew together. We had difficulties. It wasn't like, you know, it was instant, like, oh, we loved each other. We had difficulties, and that's what made the relationship grow, grow because we dealt with them. We spoke it out. That's important. Okay, separate subject. Yesterday, my girlfriend and I, we were discussing, I'm not even going to talk about what the content was because it was very esoteric and theoretical. And there's something that I believe that she thought was a fairy tale. And I was like, but you believe this? Like, how ludicrous. And then she brought up something and I was like, I'm not even discussing that with you because that's so ridiculous. And later on, 
when I was thinking by myself, I realized that if what she was saying was true, it actually supports what I was saying. And I said to her this morning, I said, you know, if that's true, then that actually would make what I said more likely. And she agreed. And so we wound up having a conversation. So what if both of those things are true? And I just mentioned that because it's kind of important when you think about how you get people who totally disagree to now look at something different. So I, I just wanted to share both of those thoughts. Thank you. Uh, in in the uh, FJB call just before, uh, we brought up the dialogic versus dialectic, which was sort of an obscure thing for me, but I think it was Jack or Marc-Antoine put into the chat this distinction, which is interesting given what you just said. I think Marc-Antoine, was it you? Oh, it was one of us on the call, I've forgotten who. It was Jack, perfect, thanks. Uh, Rick. Uh, I, I nearly thought lost my my trend of thought, uh, Stacy, by what you're saying about your emotional attachment. Because at the conference, they also had a moment of silence of all the people who died in the last year of the conference, and I knew several of them, and I was just shocked. I thought, oh gosh, I didn't realize he passed, and he passed, and he passed. And I mean, it's a, it's a sharp reminder of of um, you know um, how how precious life is because you never know when your calling card's going to come and what can you you know how can you have a blast while it lasts you know i mean that's my my ethos but uh there was one thing that happened at the so many things happened at the conference but this is the first time i have ever encountered somebody who describes themselves as a relational scientist mm -hmm. i'd never heard of that i mean i i know the two terms but as a as a discipline and I sat to some next to somebody who was uh, that we started chatting away and, uh, you know, I really made a great connection with her. And I said, well, you know, I, you know, I edited a book back in nine, in the mid nineties on uh, partnerships and healthcare transform, transforming relational process. And then the person she's trying to recruit to Tufts is um, somebody who I've known for a long time. And I bumped into him at the airport and had this conversation about that conversation and he 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 wants to go and work with her and i mean it's just these serendipities of these connections that can happen at conferences but actually how they might continue on and just to dovetail on something that jose was talking about, i think the biggest challenge about collective it getting things together and i concur with you completely and everything you said but the problem is i i had a conversation with somebody on the way to the airport and a text and he was saying it was so difficult to get everyone to come together. I mean, this group of academics are oh, plates are overflowing, brilliant minds, but it's atomized. The, you know, the, it's very difficult, except in your little you know microcosm of your little research area that you might know some other people, whatever. And so the challenge of doing something at a community level, and this is what I'm going to try and do over the next year, and see whether I've had any success. Well, who's the customer, so to speak? You were saying, Jerry. How can you bring together? What's the attractor to bring people together and say, let's do this together rather than, you know, being, you know, in this atomized world. So I think it's a real challenge about how to, what's the attractor to bring people together. And I think you were talking earlier about, well, what's the vision? If you, unless you have a shared vision, it's very difficult to get people together. And then they have to buy into the vision because if they don't buy into the vision, they're not going to, they don't, they won't give a, they won't give a, you know, two hoots about it. So anyway, what were you doing, Jose? Um, I don't think it's about bringing people together and agreeing. I think it's just the opposite. Um, I didn't say agreement. I'm, I'm saying bringing people together. I'm not even sure that it's about bringing people together. Mm -hmm. um, well, explain your meaning and then I'll explain mine. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so what I've learned, because I would have, thought that that was what we need to do. I did think that. And what I've learned through this work, uh, especially by doing some pretty deep dives into open source, 
the best projects in open source that deliver good solutions are the ones where people disagree the most. What you end up with is a whole bunch of forks and attempts at things and, and different solutions to the same problem and different ways of trying to do the same thing. And then it, somehow it attracts better quality people with better quality solutions and it creates outputs that like you would think, oh, this project is su so successful. This must be the project. And then you look at it and you go, wait a minute, it's been forked a thousand times. It came from being forked from a thousand times. And it's the one that just happens to be sort of making it. The, the thing that, that there is togetherness on, in my view, is that the process of iteration, the process of, of contributing to things, it's not so much that I have to agree that your solution is the right solution or my solution is the right solution or that we have to even see eye to eye. It's just that at some point, if you try something and it fails, you're willing to look over at what I'm doing and saying, hmm, maybe the thing that I thought was kind of stupid is the right way to go. Let me start thinking about that. And or maybe there's a middle ground between where I was and where he is. And let's try that. It's this recognition that it, it, it's a it's a work in progress. It's not I'm right and you're wrong, but that it's a work in progress. And and that's the ethos that I think we need to get, that it's all a work in progress. And I think if we can all agree on that, then the structures by which we do the work in progress support the ability to do things over time collaboratively not by sitting down and getting everybody to agree on the same thing, but by building an environment where people can build on each other's work in, in a non-competitive, competitive in a certain way and non-competitive in another. And I don't know how to describe that. Co-opetition co co is enough. Let me just say, when, when I say together, I don't mean, I don't, I'm not talking about agreement at all. Okay. Just, oh no! Quite, quite the Good. best. The, the best gatherings is where there are differences and disagreements. And I had lots of disagreements at this conference. It was fantastic, and the people didn't take the differences seriously. They were willing to explore things. I mean, in a similar way that Stacy was talking about the differences that you had, and thought, well, maybe they're not so different. Maybe there's an overlap between the two. So, yeah. My apology for misunderstanding. No, that's okay. No, it's yeah. assumptions. It's 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 semantic clarification. That's all. We're just working our way to understanding each other a little bit better. It's good. Uh, Mark and Tom? Uh, that, that's really interesting what you said, uh, Jose. I, my experience of powerful, on the one hand, I totally agree. I mean, when there's forking, there's experiments. And, 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 and the idea that let's make experiments, and uh, I, I quoted Strong Opinions Weekly Held, and, and, and let's see what works. And let's, on the other hand, I, I'm, the kind of person who wants a good solid underpinning. And, you know, I <laughs> made that. Uh, I think we need both. I think this is, uh, we need both the ability to diverge and we need the ability to say, you know, we need this infrastructure because my basic best examples of good open source projects, I think of Python, I think of Postgres, I think of, you know, there's a strong thorough line. There is, I'm not saying there's no forking, but there's uh, the forks have mostly fed into the thorough line. Uh, thank God. Um, it's it's and and we need enough of substrate to be able for the experiments to cross pollinate. If there's so much divergence that it becomes difficult to cross pollinate, we've lost the mm -hmm. value of the experiments. And that's why I'm so focused on let's agree on the data format and let's agree on this. Not that I think I have the data format, but I want a data format that ag 
allows cross-pollination. And for me, that's a kind of threshold of agreement mm -hmm. after which you can play. I'm oh, go ahead. I'm going to have to bounce from the call pretty shortly, but go ahead, Jose. You've got the last. I, word. I am as well. Uh, I was just going to say, I think there's a there's a balance in that. You know, there's there's totally. it's going to be very hard to 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 find the right answer uh, without yes. experimenting. And it's going yes. to be very hard to um, to create experiments without finding the right answer. <laughs> so yeah, exactly, exactly my point. It's a balance. So I was going to, you know, wear the other hat. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, thank you all for a really great call, and let's keep Stuart in our thoughts um, as we walk into our days. Um, thank you. See you. Thank you so much.